Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Deconstructor of Fun podcast. I'm your host, Mishka Katkoff, and today my guest is Gerard Miles, a headhunter and a founder of Mission One. Gerard has 15 years of experience working in recruitment, especially in executive headhunting. Uh, and currently he works with the largest publishers, game publishers in the ecosystem uh, based out of US, EU, Middle East, and Asia. So anybody you can think of. Now, this is a fascinating podcast because you'll get a really valuable insight into the complexities of hiring gaming executives. Uh, we'll talk about things like cultural integration, the pros and cons of hiring execs outside the industry, the importance of leadership, communication, and strategic understanding. Um, I think the key takeaways for everybody here is that you'll have you'll understand the inner works of an executive headhunting. Now that is very va- valuable. Whether you end up employing a headhunter at some point or get contacted by one, so. Overall, a fascinating episode. I really hope everybody enjoys this one. I enjoy talking to Gerard. He has such a wealth of knowledge and and experience and insights. And I'm hoping he'll come back on a podcast to address some of the uh, some new topics. And by the way, in this episode, uh, there was a Slack uh, conversation on on Deconstructor Fun Slack channel, and we integrated a lot of community questions. Though we'll, those will be towards the end. So. If you enjoyed this podcast, give it a thumbs up, uh, leave a comment. We always enjoy those and um, have a great day. This podcast is brought to you by Data Amp. Now, you're asking, didn't they get acquired by Sensor Tower? They did. And that's awesome. Here's why. Whether you loved using data.ai or Sensor Tower, the combined company will offer customers even stronger and more detailed insights on the full digital customer journey. Exciting times lie ahead as Sensor Tower and Data Agile enforces. Go to data.ai or sensortower.com and get on board with undeniably the best data partner in the business. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Mishka. Delighted to be here. Let's first tell the audience who are you and what do you do. I know you've been as uh, a headhunter and an executive hunter for almost fifteen years now, uh, focusing especially on the games industry for the last what a decade or so. Am I correct? Absolutely, Mishka. So uh, I'm a I'm a headhunter. Uh, so that's involved in executive search, which is finding VP, C-level uh, executives for companies. Um, I've worked across many industries, actually. I started off doing industrials headhunting, uh, placing sort of people to run factories out in uh, auto, <laughs> uh, tier one auto out in, in Germany. So I've come come away uh, and about probably sort of you know, five, ten years ago, discovered uh, the world of games. I always was a personal gamer uh, and I never realized that you could actually be a gamer uh, and a headhunter, a headhunter in games, uh, until I picked up some searches in it, and and the rest is history. Uh, mm. <laughs> so yeah, so and you work with a lot of like so you represent Mission One, which is your own company. So you work with other uh, headhunting companies, and recently you've set up your own called Mission One. Um, since we're talking about games, what is your special skill as an executive headhunter? Like what is what is unique about Mission One and yourself, especially? Yeah, and I think you know, t- taking a step back to to sort of why why executive search in games as well. I think that that's relevant to your question. Is that mm-hmm. you know, games has been such a, a close knit industry for a long time, right? It was it's an industry where everyone knew everyone for a long time, um, particularly in 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 regions, right? So people would know everyone in London or everyone in Helsinki knew everyone else, etc. Um, what what you what we saw is that from two thousand and ten onwards, really, with the rise of mobile. The, the games world suddenly got a lot larger uh, and therefore just relying upon your your local network might mean that you were missing out on people right so so executive search wasn't really sort of needed as much in the games industry until until sort of about 2010 onwards when when the world started to expand and, and we noticed that and we saw you know an opportunity there to say look if there's someone who's really deeply specialized in games uh, but also is very international in, in terms of their network, then you have a very clear value proposition to the market. So that was always our sort of a unique sort of angle, as it were, was we know games very deeply, but we also know the people, say, if you're in London, we know the people in Montreal 
or San Francisco. If you're in San Francisco, we know the people in Istanbul, right, or, or in Barcelona who might not be on your radar, but are very high quality, very skilled and actually very relevant to your to your, your network. So, you know, that was part of the, the, the thinking. And then, you know, we co-founded Mission One about two years ago. Um, and, and that was just a you know ambition to really take that brand and idea further and just sort of say, hey, look, the games industry is is growing. How do we how do we really service that as it continues to grow and evolve? Um, because games is actually um, much more than games nowadays, right? Games is, is touching on all areas of consumer and and other sectors uh, as well. Yeah, um, gamification. Gamification, exactly. And you know, again, a lot of our clients actually don't look like games companies. They're education companies. They're fitness companies. They're um, you know, dating companies. They're fashion companies. Something like that. But they they want to get that knowledge from the games world. That you know, games are very good at retaining attention, which is valuable to a lot of people, and they're also very good at teaching a certain type of behavior or encouraging a certain type of behavior, such as you know, through gamification. So that's they, they, those two things are very relevant to a lot of other sectors, um, which is why we've seen this sort of both an influx of talent from outside games into games, but also a, a sort of an outflow of talent from games in, into other sectors. Yeah, that's so, so an executive headhunting is, um, I assume, different than hiring um what do you would you call like staffers or experts or professionals so what is a how first of all what is an executive and what is the typical process for headhunting for an executive in gaming or in in apps yeah so so our executive so you do it both on title and and on on salary band so so the roles of the salary we're working on tend to start at sort of 150 to 200 thousand dollars in terms of uh, annual total compensation and that can go all the way up to the millions of, mm-hmm. of um uh, in, in terms of annual uh, compensation in dollars um also in terms of title it tends to be from the sort of senior director level through to vp c level and then board tends to be where you have the executive um executive search piece and it, it's different because um you know, those tend to be um very specific searches they're they're really critical often to your organization it's often got eyes on from the very top so the board might be involved this you know the c-level is certainly going to be involved the ceo's time and energy often this can be a real priority uh, for them to make this hire and, and in some cases it's sort of the most important hire or decision that they might make in a year right if you're getting a new chief product officer right for your mobile games company it's pretty. It's pretty important. You're getting that right, right? Or if you're, you know, you're going through a tech replatforming and it's, it's getting the right CTO, or you know, you're expanding into America, right? And and you've got to get the right CRO, uh, Chief Revenue Officer, in there, right? This is this is mission critical stuff. And you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, you know, people are your most important asset. Um, I think you know, we've all worked in organisations or seen organisations which have thrived when the C level people we respect and seem to be, you know very capable and, and steering the ship in the right direction and we, we can probably all think of examples where you think okay well the the sea level executives they weren't going the right direction and you can see two three five years down the line you know it has a, has a pretty major uh, impact so it's it's a much sort of higher intensity process there's usually more rounds of process there's a lot more energy up front in scoping the role um, there's a lot more energy in the negotiation and closing of a role that all these sort of these factors um, you know, push it into what, what we would describe as executive search. It's it's a very sort of time intensive uh, process. It's taking you know, three to four months uh, uh, and a lot of energy from a lot of you know high profile people uh, to get right. This podcast is brought to you by Apps Flyer. In today's digital world, understanding your app's journey from discovery to download is more than just insightful. It's essential. Enter Apps Flyer the leader in mobile attribution and marketing analytics that allows you to measure the full potential of your marketing efforts, making every ad dollar work smarter. With AppsFlyer, that's your new reality. Dive deep into data-driven insights that reveal exactly where your users come from and how they interact with your app. AppsFlyer, where your app's potential meets performance. And and what's the, so, so if I understand correctly, when, when doing an executive search, the involvement of stakeholders has to be very high. Exactly. And, and, and that's right from the start, right? And I think, you know, we talk about process. 
uh, in terms of what exact what does executive search look like for, for, for your listeners um so it starts off with quite an intensive uh, uh kickoff session we're often talking to multiple stakeholders across the organization getting their input cross-referencing that because actually not always you know not everyone's aligned at the start as you can uh <laughs> probably imagine that's you know a yes. common theme <laughs> Um, and that's okay, right? It's okay to get that, but it's actually quite important to get that out ahead of a process rather than encountering that you know, two, three months in when they're you know, they're arguing about a candidate and they say, well, uh, but we wanted this. And somebody else is going, no, we don't, we want this. And you, that, you don't want to have that conversation late <laughs> in the day. Um, then you're into a process of quite intense um, your research and mapping, as, as we call it. So identifying the right candidates. And a, a question I always get asked is, I suppose, socially is like, how, how do you find these people, right? Like, what's the... Yes, um, exactly. Uh, you know, and, and so where are these people? And, and why can't I earn, you know, millions of dollars, please? Can you earn that million? That's, you know, um, so these, these are the joyous questions you get asked as a headhunter. Um, and I think, you know, the answer lies, in, it's probably in a number of different factors, right? And, and it's like... Um, Imagining you're you're you've got it you're, you're cutting a cake and you're slicing it in different directions to maximize the number of sort of individual slices you're you're getting. So, you know, one is the network, right? And that's that's the most important, right? We call people up, we source them. You know, let's say you know we work across um, technology and games, we're across mobile games, PC consoles, and this gamification world. So we know lots of people already in that world. So if we get a mandate coming in, we say, okay, right, who do I know who who's going to know the best people for this role because each role is individual, right? Like not, you know, all, all chief product officer roles are different. All chief revenue officer roles are slightly different. And, and you can go to those people and say, okay, well, who, you know, which of the companies you really respect, right? Who's doing really well in the last five years? Who's got that winning formula and that winning strategy? Who's been leading that effort, right? Like, um, you know, why did that work? So you're gathering all this intel, which is both relevant for the search, but actually also is very relevant for your client as well to understand, okay, what's the lay of the landscape? Because, the the, the the sort of the higher, as it were, the person you're hiring is really at the, like the tip of an iceberg of, of, of a broader challenge, right? You're trying to, you know, the hire is to solve something else, right? It's not the, the goal in itself. So this sort of intel of like, okay, well, how are these, how did this company structure their marketing function? I got that asked the other day, like, how, do, how does it work at these other companies? I just want to know, right? Like, what mm -hmm. should I, should my user acquisition and my performance marketing, how should they relate, right, together? Um uh, so that's sort of the intel piece and the, and the research and the sourcing. And then you're layering that in with also um, more desk-based research of looking at the market, saying, okay, who's grown, whose share price is doing well, who, you know, which games are top grossing in this market, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then trying to identify people as well who might not cover from your, your sourcing. So you're going through multiple layers of trying to work out, okay, who, who are the right people? And then also, actually, even when you're interviewing people, you're also still gaining information, right? People sort of mention, okay, we benchmarked against this company or, um, you know, like actually my old boss was great at this X, Y, Z. So you're, you're sort of putting all the pieces together to try and work out, okay, who's been solving relevant challenges? Who's been really sort of excellent in this market? And then, you know, how do we get to those people and find them? And then, you know, the next part of that is, um, you know, once you're through the research is outreach, getting them on the phone, assessing them, understanding, okay, are they a good fit? And then you're through to managing those people through 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 a process. There's quite a lot there, actually. So I'll pause, uh, Vishka, is, is, is there any particular yeah. thing click on? No, no, it's it's super important. So so first of all, your network, then the research that that comes through that, and then the outreach starts. And uh, I think the, the first, these three steps seems to be quite, um, I wouldn't say simple, but clear. So you just do your work. I assume that the real challenges come at the outreach step, because if you've done, when you've done your research correctly, uh, you're reaching out to the most valuable candidates who have grown their companies, who are very precious uh, resources in the companies that they work with. And you're coming in and saying, hey, why don't you leave the company where you've done all these great things and you have your team and you have your support system that you're most likely appreciated and go to another company where nobody knows you and you have to take on a leadership position. That is not uh, an easy proposition. Like, like people only think about the money, but most likely your candidates are already well compensated and, and doing good in the companies that they're working at. So how do you kind of how do you handle the outreach? How do you ha how do you get these great candidates to switch uh, positions? Yeah, it's it's a great question, Mishka, because you're right. Like we often say, you know, a lot of the best candidates, not all, but a lot of the best candidates, are not looking for a new role. Right? They are 
because they're the best people in their organization, they're being well looked after, they're given the best resources, you know, they're, they're well compensated. They've And they've built up, as you note, a lot of political capital in their organization. They know how to get things done. They've got friends, et cetera, in that. So, you know, that is that is clearly a value proposition for the headhunters. Um, the other side of that, though, and, and it, it, people might be um, surprised by this, is, is that you know these people actually, though, are often some of the most career conscious of of the executive pool, right? Because they've got to these levels um, is not by accident, right? Like people people often get to that C level, SVP level because they they have a certain ambition or drive that pushes them towards thinking holistically about their career um and and thinking about you know what's my purpose where do i want to go and usually you know the question that we often are delving into is okay well what's what's super meaningful for you to achieve in the next five years of your career right what's going to get you really juiced up and you know, the other side of this mission is often like you know p- people like change and they like challenge right and and the flip side of hey i'm super well settled my life is great is that some people that's that's not enough right they're like okay starting to get a bit turning the wheel now right i've job job done mission complete i could stay here for five years and make a lot of money and be very comfortable but they they've sort of moved beyond that right that's not the primary goal of of why they're getting out of bed in the morning and you know it's you know Michigan, when we talk about headhunting like in in general right the, the reality is you've got you've just got individuals in front of you right like you've got that executive and i can think of someone i i, I headhunted once from the u.s um and they were very well placed. They're doing very well with a big you know, mobile games publisher. But I'd spoken to them before and I knew that the opportunity I had is for, to, to run a very top to 30 grossing uh, mobile game title. Um, it's doing hundreds of millions a year in, in, in revenue. But I knew this was what they wanted because I'd spoken to them before, like a year ago. I said, like, hey, you've got to look at this, right? You've got to, you've got to consider this because I know you're happy, but this is ticking all your boxes of what you said would find, uh, you know, exciting. And in the end, they, they relocated from San Francisco um, uh, uh, with their family and they, they took the job on. So you have those sort of moments and 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 like a lot of jobs, Mishka, right? Like the, the, it per, it's perceived that the, the moment of triumph is in the call, right? Like you've somehow got this magic sale call that you're going to like call up a super happy person, <laughs> convince them they're not happy, right? Like you're know, like... Um, those movies where they call people up and get them to buy shares or something like that it's um, yeah. you're not you know I, I that's certainly not our approach right you're not this sort of salesman who's who's going to tip the balance in a phone call what you're doing is trying to build a long-term relationship and it really is a long-term game you're often talking to executives over five six seven years before you might actually play someone i mean i, I can't remember when we first spoke mishka but i feel like it's a while ago and maybe we had like a little bit of relationship and then you know you pick up the phone and something suddenly, suddenly it's something interesting you're like oh wow this is this is kind of cool actually like this is oh. this is turning you know turning turning the dials um and um you know that's that's what it is and, and the sort of the success moment is is actually built off years of of general relationship building right the sort of hey this is an interesting article or like oh do you want to get to know index or andreessen horowitz let's just like an outreach call right like just go go meet them and, and and be a friend and then they're like oh well gerard knows so knows me a little bit and he's made some good intros and like when he he's saying you should look at this this is exciting that piques my interest um so there's a lot of that now to your question there still is the like the sell bit there's got to be a hook that you're creating that's that's interesting and you're also again working with your client to understand who is that relevant to right because you can't go call up some candidates are not going to be interesting about some opportunities, right? So you've got to understand a little bit of, okay, where does my, where's my story going to resonate, right? Who's it going to be exciting to? Uh, and why are they going to, like, why does it make sense for them to move? And and I think you can also sort of integrate some of that thinking in your outreach. Um, another pe- bit of it, and it, it's obvious, but be super honest. Again, I, I think, you know, like one of the things that's changed about headhunting, we all get all this, this spam, right? Like this just, <laughs> hey, like, do you want to be, I mean, I get it. Like, hey, you'd be a perfect fit for an engineer at Netflix in San Francisco. I get, and it's like, no, I, I, I'm like, I'm not scared of the AI if this is what it's like trying to ping me, right? Like, um, and and you get a lot of that, right? And, and sometimes people are just relieved to you say like, hey, like, I know you're super settled. I saw you've just been acquired, so I think you've probably got an earn out for the next year. But this is really interesting, and it matches your experience. Like, would you be interested in finding out more? Right. And that level of like, oh, this person is like understood, not just even my CV, but 
has done a little bit of digging to understand like we got acquired or like oh you went into my profile to realize like i'm the the person who's been building our unreal games effort right out of a studio that mainly does unity like and and that's why you've picked me out does just elevate you quite in quite subtle ways and you spend a lot of time reading the profile thinking about the approach even if it's only condensed to two three lines of what you've actually written the thought can can shine through and really stand you out against um the noise of the market that is that is linked in and the depression that sometimes can can be <laughs> be from spending too much time on social media You've heard of Heroic Labs by now, and we keep talking about them because in today's mature market, you need every edge to be successful. Rather than spending those precious company dollars on building game tech, focus on building your game and shipping it. Get into your players' hands faster and grow your community. Heroic Labs is battle-tested partner and friend of the podcast. Their tech enables you to be flexible, creative, and scale for success. Heroic Labs has your tech stack covered. Whether you're looking for a world-class backend game server, an amazing game development framework, fantastic live ops tooling, or reliable mass scalability, Heroic Labs has solutions for all of these challenges. And it's not just us at Deconstructor of Fun praising Heroic Labs. The company works with some of the world's biggest publishers on many of the beloved games. Focus on your game, save a big chunk of cheese, and avoid tech risks with Heroic Labs. Step into the future of game monetization with Exola. Exola empowers developers and publishers to market, sell, connect, and optimize their games globally. From payment solution to a full suite of tools designed to grow your game's revenue while fostering a lawyer player base. Exola is your game's gateway to worldwide success. With Exola, the world is your playground. Visit exola.com today and find all the solutions that will help you to power your games into success everywhere. That's a that's a really interesting point that you've made, and and that is that the uh, each of the headhunter has their own network, and that network is built throughout the years. And the more senior the position, the more important is this personal aspect, because the more senior you are, the more of course outreaches you get from different recruiters, and and. At some point, the volume just keeps on increasing and you're less interested. But if it's Gerard, who you know from the previous years, you've had multiple different conversations about different companies, even though it hasn't resulted into something tangible, even you if you haven't, you keep still in, you know, in contact with that person, uh, raise new things, talk about other things, talk about the industry, kind of learn from that person about other uh, potential companies or or, um, or people you should be looking at. And so you develop this relationship over years. And eventually, so, you know, it, it tends to lead to, um, to, you know, you're getting your idea across that the person would be at least interested in talking to the company that is looking to, uh, to hire for an executive position. Am I correct? That, that's correct. And Mishka, I'd love to, to flip the question to you, right? I'm sure you get <laughs> all sorts of outreaches about all sorts of wonderful and weird jobs. Uh, the world. What 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 resonates with you? What what makes you think like, hey, I'm going to pick up the phone or I'm, I'm going to reply to that message if it's if it's coming in. I would say what you you what you described. I actually noticed that now that you spoke about it, I don't much reply to people who I don't know, and so it just like automatically is not interesting. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know why. It just it just like oh, I don't know this and. Sounds weird, and sometimes I click on the link, but ah, not not really. No, no, not maybe. No, thank you, thank you, but no thanks. And sometimes not even placing the the automatic reply. But then when somebody who I know reaches out, then at least I feel obliged to have a conversation, at least a call. Like, okay, well, let's chat about this because I know you, and I can't just ghost you. But yes, it is very easy to ghost people, especially on LinkedIn who you don't know, who just throw in, you know, these long tirades about a different company <laughs> and a compensation packages and whatnot. And you're like, okay, all right, all right. Like, you don't know me. This is not personalized and so forth. So it feels spammy. Yeah, I think that's, and I see that a common, common mistake is people just putting loads of information in, right? And it's like very obviously auto sent out to like I don't know, a thousand people. And it's, yes. it's such a turnoff. Um, and I think you know, it degrades the brand. I and mean, also, the other thing that we do a lot of is um, 
getting getting live uh, getting warm intros from people right it's like again if you if your friend who you try it's all about trust right like a, so much of life is about trust right if if somebody you trust says hey you should talk to this person about this role you know you're going to do it for that friend right you know it, it doesn't matter like it's not it's nothing about the role or even the the, the headhunters involved it's sort of okay well i trust that person so if they've said it's it's good I feel good about investing my time, right? Because time is time is precious, and you, you, yeah. you know you've only got so much to invest. So, um, you know, th there's a lot of a lot of it around just long term relationship, and just I just think being authentic as well around why you're reaching out that that over the longer term, um, you know, helps. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very good point that you're raising with the uh, with especially executive headhunting that this is less transactional and more of a networking type of a business where you are really talking to a lot of people and even these outreaches that don't lead to an interview process mm -hmm. still lead to that person becoming part of your network and then later down you know after several years like you've been doing this for 15 years and you probably still interact with the people uh, from 10 12 13 years ago uh, even though they're not actively looking but you might you know catch up with them once a while maybe once a year uh, twice a year to um, to see how things are doing and understanding the, the market better and and through that maybe learning that they would be interested in something that you may or may not have now or may have in a few years yeah and um it's a bit of a curveball but one one business i think if i just take a, like a sideways step into another business i don't know if you know the bankers areem yeah and co you yeah. know those guys right? oh well, like, well yeah um, of course <laughs> of course i think they're show, right like so so they you know i i looked you know we looked to them as a business we just like respect a lot so so reem for your listeners are an investment bank and um whenever we even interact with them they just they just care about their clients needs right you can tell like they just want to solve a problem for their clients and they want to think really laterally and really broadly and they're just so well respected. I don't think I've ever met someone who's not like, oh, Areem, great. Like, you know, who's heard of them? They're like, yeah. oh, yeah, they're great to interact with. And I, I just, you know, that's that's a model that Mission One we sort of look up to. And we sort of think, wow, like, you know, this these are like long-term partners. They really care about the industry. And they're not just simply there like, hey, have you got a deal for me? Can I close it? Yes, no, yeah. goodbye. They're thinking, oh, all right, I can't help you. But actually, I know someone who can. Let me make an intro. Let me, you know, put put you in contact with someone. And, you know, that's that's sort of where, you know, the, the, so the mission of Mission One is making connections that change lives. Um, and that's sort of, you know, where, where we stem from. And I think, you know, over time, it shows out, right? And it shows out regardless of headhunting, it shows out. I mean, again, for people who are doing their own hiring, right? Don't think about, okay, just this hire, right? And this one data point of this interaction and like, you know, trying to spam through and sell someone and get something quick. Think, hey, six months later, they might be talking to someone who says to me, hey, I've got approached by this company. What do you think about it, right? And that their interaction with you is, is incredibly important, right? Like, so even if they weren't the right candidate or like you didn't close them, and I, I've, you know, I'll tell you a story. I, I had a, had a, a someone I, I worked with like six years ago and then two years, like four, so four years later, so about two years later, somebody called me up who I know really well and they said, oh, I'm, I'm interviewing this company. What do you think? And I was like, oh, it's interesting actually. Like, you know, like I, I you know, like there's some, there's some, some, some details there, right? Which I can share with you that, you know, their behavior was a little bit sharky. Like I was just had a few question marks about this and that behavior and, you know, all the rest. And, you know, that's four years on, right? Like there's somebody's that, 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 that experience is coming back. Right. And they will never know that you know, this, this information, but it's going on all the time. Right. I remember being yes. sat uh, at a GDC or somewhere and I was chatting to a CEO and somebody walked past and just said, Oh, can I just catch you? What do you think about these guys? Would you work them? They're like, yeah, you know, and that's it. Right. Like that's, and again, you have no idea what, what the network is, is saying out either so so really you know, as much as could be advice to people about hiring who are looking at making as executive hires is is think deeply about every interaction because even quite small ones even if it's saying no to a candidate right and we're going off topic but even the rejection yeah. process of a candidate i see this going you know we talk about what what do people sometimes do poorly is like they they handle candidates in rejection poorly right and it's like oh we didn't get any feedback or like the feedback didn't make sense or like if you have a really honest conversation with someone about saying like hey you didn't get the job and these were the reasons and it's honest it can be like hey we didn't think you were strong enough on these answers candidates will so much prefer that than the like the the the, the bs of the like oh we just had a great slate you know if it's not true right? again it could be true but yeah. if, if it's not it can be you can turn what is quote unquote a sort of a negative uh result into a positive reaction and that 
that impacts your brand and that impacts your ability to go get great great quality people over over, over the long run again in the short run you might not feel it but over the mid to long run it, it really impacts you yeah well it's a long-term game uh let's let's get into more of a sort of a detailed questions yeah. so what do you think qualifies what do you think i mean you probably know but what what qualities really uh differentiate ex exceptional executives from the rest like yeah. what really stands out yeah it's a it's a great question and i think i think you know again so, so to the highest level and the, the easy answer is i think the leadership quality right and, and then the question is mm. again what does what does that mean right because as people get more senior in their organization they they tend to be taken away from the actual work right the functional work right so the the CTO is not coding. The, the the CMO is not you know doing the data sheets on the on the performance marketing right. right? So so what made them good at the start is now less relevant. Uh, they've got to know enough to be dangerous is is the sort of the phrase. But really, uh, as you move up, it's it's about leadership, and that's the ability to influence the organization. It's the ability. I think it relies very heavily on communication. So that's a really key skill. And communication, you know, you could, we could do a whole podcast on that, right? But it's about listening. Uh, primarily, I think there is is understanding what's going on. You know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the best execs I talk to is like, you know, what did you do? Well, we came in and I just talked to these teams and then I found out why they were unhappy. And then I did something about it. And you're like, oh, that sounds super simple, right? Well, what had been happening before? But the reality is like what had been happening before is like, no, you've got to do this. Like, like you know this team isn't on the same page as me like what's going on right like we've got to change the team got to you know and and it's it's sort of it's it's nuance but it's not rocket science i think you know and i think this is something i'm really passionate about actually is that and you know perhaps if you're you know listen to this and you're thinking well, how do i get to sea level right like it's not some innate property that like certain people were just born with it and like it's it's magic and you just get it's skill sets Okay, to get to a ten out of ten, maybe you know that's that's not easy to do, right? But hey, if you're like a three or a four out of a, a skill set, I'm pretty sure anyone with with enough application and, and effort can get to a seven seven out of ten, right? Which is pretty good, right? And like it's already you know upskilling, and then there are other things they'll naturally spike even even higher on. So you know, I think leadership is something you can get you can read books about. Um, good to great is a, is a really good one. I'm sure. You know, you've had that recommended. Oh, or maybe, maybe again, maybe people will, will, will uh, have different views on what their you know, top leadership. Radical candor is another one. I think this is really interesting, which is about how to communicate honestly and effectively. Um, and uh, you know, through learning to communicate, through learning to listen, and then get your your message out right. Get real clarity. Okay, this is the direction we're all going in. Everyone's had a chance to understand. It's not about doing what everyone says, right? It's not about listening to everyone and then just doing what they say, but giving them a framework where they can understand, okay, this is possible, this is not possible. Uh, and then also at that C-level, you're working with other functions a lot more, right? That 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 cross-functional collaboration is really important, right? Like, the again, the, the marketing and sales and tech and product, right? That they're all, you know, steaming together, HR, they're all sort of you know, steaming together towards a shared vision. Um, that becomes uh, super critical uh, as well. And then I think the other thing that really stands out is st strategic understanding, right? Like the, you know, we were just talking about that, the, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of the, the short termism. You know, everyone's in a rush today, right? Everyone's got a priority. Everyone, if you're a listed company, it's quarterly. If you're in a you know, growth startup, it's, it's, you know, like just surviving the next six months. I think when you're getting your, your C-level executives in or your VP or, you know, your executive levels there, it's understanding, okay, well, this is the strategic outlay, right? This is where we're playing. This is how we're doing today, but this is how we're going to win in, in two to three to five years. And that's really difficult to assess. And I think that's, well, it's, it's definitely difficult to find and, and to focus on. But that, I think, is also a really key understanding of, okay, well, what's, what's our reason to win over the long term? Um, because, again, there's a lot of noise in today's world of social media and X companies raise this and like, oh, Y companies doing this with AI or like, you know, and, and it's easy to get caught up in that hype cycle of like what's hot right now. But, you know, I mean, everyone's talking about NVIDIA, right? Like, oh, it's so great. And like, this is crazy. But again, it, it all goes back to sometimes like quite, I mean, sometimes a bit of luck, but also quite boring, you know, fundamentals of like, well, this is the market we're going to play in and we're going to play in it really well. We're going to do it for a long time. And then suddenly we're going to, you know, we're going to overtake IBM who weren't 
playing in this market or weren't. It's strategic and it's long term that, that makes these, these companies successful. It's not some eureka moment or some heroic effort that one person came up with one product. It's, it's often a, you know, it's, it's, it's a long journey going back. Got it. Okay, so four things that I that I kind of listed here. Mm. So number one being the, the like what makes an exceptional executive. So one is being leadership, and and oftentimes when somebody says leadership, they imagine somebody who's like a, a fantastic speaker and a super charismatic person. <laughs> but it's more yeah. about like ability to influence the organization, and different people have different ways of influencing the organization. Some are great uh, through communication, others are great through data. Um, and and so forth, but but really understanding how to navigate an organization is uh, is a proof that they are able to influence it, uh, rather than there are also situations I've been doing that <laughs> maybe <laughs> at some occasions where you just. Um, bull rush at something and that's not the best that's the worst way to try to influence the organization because you're getting the counter reaction and not the uh not the uh, the positive reaction <laughs> so um, yeah and just yeah. You know, your point there about charismatic leadership i think is a great one because i think we often it's it's like it's hardwired into us to respect charismatic leaders right and that, that's the whole point of charisma i think i think but there's both studies on this on leadership that have been done but actually a, a charismatic leader can be a, a double-edged sword so again, it's not to say don't hire charismatic people, but the irony is they don't they don't have to fight as hard on data to win arguments. They can get what they want because they're charming, because they understand X, Y, Z, right? And that can be good, but actually it can be, you know, if they've got blind spots, if they're not listening to the other arguments, if they're able to get a bad idea through a committee based on their their charisma versus their you know, their facts and their strategy, that can be the most damaging thing for your organization. So yeah, I think it's really, you know, uh, uh, like unlocking yourself a little bit. Again, sometimes you want a little bit of being able to stand up in front of the team and inspire. But, you know, it's it's actually sometimes the, the leaders who are, are very low ego, very thoughtful, um, know when to speak, but also know when not to speak. That's that's a real sort of X factor um, uh, there. Different positions, let's put it that way. Yeah. A charismatic CEO whose role is to raise capital is very powerful because the company can pivot and do whatever, but as long as they're able to raise capital, it's really important. A charismatic CTO might be more challenging because they would make a tech decision that is not maybe the best or CMO or any other one. Yeah, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting conversation because again, like, I mean, Mishka, I don't know if you've, I mean, I've certainly, I've seen this, mm -hmm. so like, we've seen a lot of charismatic CEOs raising capital, right? Like, and, and they don't always have happy endings, but you are right, like the, the, the no. charismatic exec, it has a place, right? And like everything is a tool. And again, I'm not against the charismatic exactly yeah. at all. It's just a sort of like, I think, I think you know, so much of like, you know, any any attribute, right, that we're, we're marking up or down, right? Extrovert, introvert, whatever you want to say, right? It's it's okay. It's just a sort of understand it. You know, if you're, if you're a board and you're thinking about your CEO or if you're a you know, CEO thinking about your exact team, understand it and then think, okay, how does this play into the other parts of my team and how does this you know you're putting together a puzzle where everything can be can be can be both a, a positive or a negative right like depending on how it's set up how it's controlled how it's influenced what kind of role or parameters you're being set and you know again it's, it's sort of um you know it's again it's a slightly classic thing again we see with executives which which might be surprising is that you know again it doesn't always make people happier getting to the the highest level right like you know the, the classic <laughs> you know like i'm i'm a bit sad because i love being in the code or again you know rather unfortunately sometimes the people we're replacing have been sort of over promoted right and it's almost like and i and i, I think it's sad as a, a society we aren't a lot more just open about like you know there's different roles for different people right and it's not all about hierarchy and getting to the top or even the people at the top hierarchically aren't necessarily we somehow perceive oh. them as better in some way as a magical like you know pedestal way and it's like no but um, yeah. <laughs> they're just better at a different skill set and you know again it might be hey you know you're better as you're better as that uber specialist running the the, the the performance marketing team or the chief architect right rather than chief technology officer right so you're better at um you know, being super deep in the tech than you were at running a hundred person team because that's not something you like and and you yeah and and uh, you know there's a stigma now you feel like you failed and it's like no you didn't fail you just put into a role that wasn't set up to you know extenuate your best bids 100 percent. that's that's ton of that is happening and and people who haven't been in executive roles always consider uh or have a certain type of a 
negative view about what it is with all the all the good and bad like they don't have to do anything they just run through meetings and it's such a happy go lucky position where you never get laid off and you just lay off everybody which is absolutely not true uh executive positions are oftentimes in my opinion nothing to be um looked at with envy i would put it that way even though the compensation might be higher uh, but if you are a truly exceptional uh individual contributor I haven't seen that big of a delta between the other uh, compensation of those. Like, like if you if you go to any tech organization, if you are on top of the food chain as an individual contributor, uh, whether in tech or in marketing, you're probably getting pretty much as 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 well compensated as the uh, the the people in the director positions and the leadership positions, but without the. <laughs> All the headache that goes with people management and being, uh, you know, being in front of people and making these decisions uh, that can very well backfire and so forth. So, so I would say that way, but kind of going back to the exceptional quality. So leadership, ability to influence organization, communication skills, of course, super important, listening, understanding, creating alignment through some kind of a framework that you're able to, to, uh, to communicate. Uh, collaboration skills, because as an executive, that means you're working in a larger organization. So you have to be able to collaborate with other divisions. And then finally, strategic understanding. So this might be related to the strategy of your craft or the, uh, or, <clears throat> or the strategy of the market, preferably the both, uh, where they go together. And through that, you're able to uh, offer long-term thinking, setting a direction that is a strategy. It's not tactical thing that is going to be for the next roadmap for the next six months, but you're building a strategy that is at least two years forward, and and you are building against that type of a strategy, if I understood correctly. So those four things. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then again, for, for each organization as well, you're, you're, every search is different. And again, so if you're you know in a in a big listed company like Activision Blizzard or Rise, you know whatever it is, right? Again, the the, the skill sets are going to be different for the type of leadership that you need from if you're a you just raised you know fifty million from Andreessen and then and you're off to the races, right? So so again, I think it's it's always I mean I, again, like we're big believers in like you have these sort of you have these general pillars, but then you're also understanding okay the nuance of the pillar here and like you know mm-hmm. what's 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 going to be like what's actually going to turn the needle in this organization might be dialed up on, on one piece of that or or another. And then, you know, another one that's, that's popular, I think, to, to also assess is that sort of growth growth mentality. Um, and, you know, I, I think so it's something we're looking in and we're always assessing is like, well, how has this person grown over their career, right? Like, how, how, have, how have they taken steps to continue and improve them, understand where their blind spots are, get mentorship or guidance, and, and are able to reflect and improve on that? And I think that's, you know, particularly when you're looking at, someone ch- changing role or size of company where there's a change in what they're doing from from now it's very rare it's exactly the same right you're moving from exactly the same thing that can also just be an extra like lens to look at when you're making these assessment about leaders is like how much mm. runway they got to keep growing and also how flexible and successful this person is going to be over the medium term because it's it's easy to make a short to, again it's easy to hire someone in and then after a year and a half it's like ah it didn't work out and that's that's really that's that's the most crushing thing right like you, you much want to much better not to make a hire at all than hire someone who's, who's out after 12 to 18 months often um in yeah reality. and and so regarding that like how do you assess the cultural fit i think it's it's quite mm. straightforward to assess the, uh, the 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 capabilities of that person because they are visible whether you're looking at the linkedin whether you're having conversation where you're going through references but but the cultural fit is is really the probably the most challenging in this type of a position that is highly reliant on other people inside that organization yeah it's, it's a really great question and, and you know and again like what is what is culture these these are some big concept words right that, that that cover many different things um so so one one is you can look at okay what cultures have they thrived in today Right. And, and there's, I'll give you two really clear examples of different cultures. It'd be Google and Amazon, right? Mm. So, so Amazon has a very process driven culture, right? They love their, their meetings and their, their like, you know, the, the documents, six page documents, everyone's read beforehand. And it's very like, it's not quite machine like, but you know, it's very like nicely ordered and processed. And, um, I had a client once he ex Amazon CEO and they're looking for product people and like, they loved all the ex Amazon people, right? Because they're all like, you know, like they just align yeah. to the way they think, and it's it's very common. It's it's very effective, right? It's clearly a hugely successful organization, but it it really does like once you meet like 15, 20 execs from the same place, you're like, 
oh, you all sort of think the same way. Like this is how you like yeah. to work. And, w- and working and backwards. It, yeah, working backwards, I believe, is the book for the uh, yeah. for the Amazon executives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they, and they love it. And that's that's great. But, you know, compare and contrast that with Google, right, which is much more free flow. Like the execs of Google is often like, oh, yeah, it's like a... I was a windsurfer champion for like 10 years and then I decided to go to Yale and then like, you know, and studied arts and now I'm I'm doing sales for Google Cloud. You're like, oh, that's that's super different and, and super cool. And, and there are often these these people who you know, it's it's much bigger, like they're they're very like big world thinkers, like, you know, it's about mission and life and everything else. And that's why they're excited because they believe what they're doing is, you know, is a part of this bigger thing. Um, but not very, you know, they're not, I think, I think they'd often find the process side a little bit, again, not say Google doesn't have process, but just to no. try and like create a really clear line between two execs that we, we were sort of funny as a, like, a, you know, as a, like this, this culture is a bit more like, a, like these people like you, people from Google and hate people from Amazon or, or vice versa. So, you know, knowing your client is one element, right? You've got to start up front with understanding okay, what is the real culture here going on? Uh, with your client and, and trying to put some parameters around that okay so are they very mission driven like again it can sometimes be factual things like do they really like remote working right like again like um you know how they set up on communication do they love slack or are they doing in-person off-sites every quarter you know some of these things are like hard hard facts but they, they influence culture and how you think about um you know a, a big clue is how you interact with the execs themselves actually and again it's, it's sort of a you know, a tip test because if you're using the executive headhunter, do remember as well that you're you're giving off signals to them, right? And you're giving off information in in every little thing that you're doing, right? Like, are you very responsive on email? Are you not? And again, it's not it's not negative or positive, but it sort of gives off an impression of okay, well, what's what's going on here, right? Like about how you communicate, or do you really listen to us and want our opinion, or are you just hey, where's my candidates? Let's go. You know, we're all about pace and transact. You know, so and again, it, it there's no right or wrong way necessarily of of, of doing these things, but it it gives off these soft signals about what's your culture like, and then when you're assessing candidates, and again to a candidate sort of advising, like there's there's a lot, there's a lot of just soft soft signals that you're giving up, right? Like how responsive are you to the emails, right? Like are you, um, you know how how prepped do you seem for the meeting? Have you looked at the brief? Did you read, did you read, I didn't send you like a four line email, but did you read the fact that this role is based in, you know, Helsinki, right? Like, did, did you read that? <laughs> or are you going to say like, yeah, I, I really want this job and I'm based in uh, Montreal. So that's cool, right? And you're like, no, I, I said that. And you know, you're like, so it's literally, and again, it's, it's not, nothing's fatal. So don't worry if you, if you haven't done something. Um, but so that's sort of giving you an idea of how prepared this person is, how they're thinking, how much chit chat do they make at the beginning of the call, right? Like how how much do they remember about your previous conversation? Um, uh, you know, like how clearly were they about answers or did you have to like dig a little bit to get to the real truth of what was going on there? Did you get the sense a little bit defensive? Um, and then, you know, the other side is it's not rocket science. Ask them, right? Say so like who are the leaders you've worked with? Like what were the environments you really thrived in? And you know, that's people will tell you because they like talking about that right i love what was your favorite period of your career you're like oh i loved it the early days yeah there's, there's a company i think it's called symbian um which wasn't a successful company it used to make sort of handheld um they, they were comp- competitors to nokia they're making phone um uh, headsets back in the 2000s yeah i think they made like uh the uh the operation system for nokia that's it. i think that's that's ex- yeah. the, exactly that's it. i remember talking to a load of execs and it wasn't a successful company eventually it didn't it didn't go on I spoke to loads of execs though from when I was doing a, a search in that space. Um, who said, "Oh, it's the best years of my career. They loved they loved working there, and, and there was this real team ethos. They just had they're all on the same page." Now, again, sadly, the product strategy wasn't right. Whatever, right? Like it didn't or whatever. You know, the market conditions didn't allow that. But you could tell that actually, a when you get that sort of that sort of um, clustering of people talking about this this. Uh, um, this culture is being good, right? You're like, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, it goes back to that Intel bit. Yeah. Like, okay, well, that's really cool. Like, who created that culture? Why was it successful? But but also you get you get sort of insights into okay, well, what, what was driving that? It was like everyone felt on the same page. Um, everyone was working super hard, but they, they felt like a team. Like, and that's often a, a common common attribute of when people are happy. It's not they're not working hard. Often they're working the hardest. Like, you know, often when they're in like a really happy setting because they, they believe in what they're doing. So you can yeah. you can sort of pick up these these little bits of um, these little sort of soft indications. Okay, what was what were the factors behind the, that culture which you enjoyed, which indicate okay what you're going to be successful in, and is that very open communication? Is that very flat? And 
you know, and and also um you know, d different nationalities there is there is a sort of a, a reality of uh, you know the scandinavian countries tend to be more geared up around low hierarchy more democratic decision making etc now interestingly some some people from the Scandinavian countries hate that they're like i hate this i like i want to go work in like i like working in american <laughs> organizations where it's like you don't have to have a committee meeting for it some people don't right so it's it's not to sort of make a, a a sort of stereotype but it's just being aware of like how these organizations might work or, or want to work and, and and how those people fit in mm, really really good point yeah that's a that's an excellent question it's like what type of environment you you uh you enjoyed and 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 the other point is like a winning culture and a great culture are not synonymous. Uh, sometimes they are, but sometimes they aren't. There are companies with absolutely fantastic cultures that fail. And, yeah. and uh, as, as you said, and there are companies, even now, with, with yeah. really challenging culture that are absolutely crushing it. <laughs> which, which I think goes back to that strategy piece, right? Like it's really yeah. deeply understanding, okay, what, what, are we, what are we providing to the market and why it's better than us? And, and I think those companies doing super well are, are very good on their strategy and on their timing. Mm. Um, if they had a great culture, they'd be going even further. I, I'd suggest, but you're right. I think I think people can get hung up, particularly early. If you're in a startup, like I'm sure you've seen that <laughs> Michigan, right? Like this is amazing culture. It was amazing culture for uh -oh. two years, and then we we ran out of money, and we're all sad now. You know, and it's yeah. like well, we didn't we didn't build anything. It's like okay, well, you know, like it it's got to be. Um, it's got to be balanced with other things. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Culture is ways of working, and ways of working has to be attuned to what you're working on and and, and what is your goal. So, anyway, so you mentioned uh, interestingly, you mentioned different nationalities and how well they work together. So, what di what role does diversity? And and I wouldn't like we can talk about diversity of diversity of minds, which is what I like to mm -hmm. uh, refer it to. Or we can take the uh, the DEI angle if you want to take that. Uh, but overall, like when you're doing these executive hires, how important is diversity? Because yeah, you mentioned that Amazon people like to work with Amazon people, and they don't want anybody from Google or like I'm not saying anybody. They don't want that type of a thinking where somebody is like ex <laughs> skating champion turned director, you know, <laughs> type of a person. Yeah, it's it's a really good question, and I, I I think I think both both angles are worth looking at, right? And and a diversity is, you know, I think getting real with you, like diversity is, um, because it's a hot it's a hot potato, right, in the market, right? Yeah. It has it has it has triggers and, and connotations and 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 um, and all the rest, and a lot of people are using the word, um, in different ways, right? So going back to that clarity of communication, you know, I think what, what's really important is is getting a handle on what do you mean by it, right? You've, you've identified yourself, right? What's Diversity, yeah. how does it play out? Well, first of all, you've got to define what you're talking about, right? And, exactly. You know, the reality is I we're not making hires, right? Like the client is always making their hire, right? Like I'm not I'm I'm presenting candidates, I'm 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 handling candidates through a process, etc. But but ultimately it's the client who's making the hire and is going to set the parameters around what they really want and what's going to fit with their organization. So there's no one easy answer, or there's no one catch-all answer that sort of captures everyone. So Different organizations will, will define diversity in, in different ways. We will guide them towards and we'll have a sort of an innate look. Hey, having a broader slate of options is always helpful for you, right? And I think, you know, there's the classic as well. You want to avoid a, a sense. It does happen, right? A sense, and people tell us about other headhunts they work with as well. They'll say like, oh, we got to a solution, but we sort of felt a little bit like this was the only person we could, we could get to, right? Like, so we're happy with the hire, but we didn't really feel like we got a sense of the market. So I think mm. I think there's you know there's a broader question of in in a search you should show someone what the market is right and even the candidate said no, hey here's tw here's the ten good people who all said no to you, right? and, and like and here's the reasons why right because like you're not paying enough or like they don't think your company's competitive enough or whatever it is right like even again if even the the negative quote unquote feedback is is helpful to see because at least you know right than than like only just seeing the people who were interested, and I think the same is true of diversity you want to keep you know, what we aim for is a diverse slate of candidates and saying, look, here are some other people. They don't fit your brief exactly. But hey, they've got other things they're bringing to the table. We think you should at least look at them, right? You should at least consider them. And this is our, you know, our opinion. We, ca we can't, you know, we're not going to sort of force you into interviews, right? Like if we can't, then that wouldn't be right. But, you know, at least make sure you've looked at different candidates. And even if they've said no, you can go away saying, look, okay, we feel like we we did, you know, approach a load of cameras. And, and I, you know, one, I, I can't say it is, but, you know, I remember one working, one, one games company and 
they were really con they had a bit of a, a bad reputation for for diversity um and they have desperately trying to hire in a a, a a female leader right they were very keen to find a diverse leader because they're like okay this this would really help us in 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 you know our um our uh, our, uh, our sort of our positioning as it were and but yeah. you know we, we're honest but we, we're saying but the problem is but you know people are like hey i've already fought that battle right like i've already done that in my own company i'm not going to come here and fight this battle again right so they're getting a lot of a lot of pushback based around that and it's, it's just you've got to give people evidence and reasons and working with them and the other reality as well if, if you say like hey if you're committed to making a diverse hire and a lot of clients are saying look we're really committed to at least having a diverse slate it's like well then you've also got to be the reality is you're, you're often going after a very, very specific profile, right? It's the five-legged unicorn that you're looking for, right? It's the classic one. Um, you know, we can't, like, create candidates. So if you're going to also want to be diverse, you've got to think more broadly about some of these parameters and whether you're going to take a candidate who maybe hasn't had the same, same leadership team uh, size experience you want or maybe hasn't operated at the scale of users that you want. However, they're super smart, coming up the curve get good references you know they could do mm. this job but they might take might be more work on you to make this hire right like it might take you six to twelve months of coaching this person into the role uh but, but then you're making a trade-off and, and you're, you're putting that you're giving that option to the client and explaining that option um Got uh, about about their decision making program that's that's really clear so basically uh when you are adding any kind of other elements than what is needed to be uh to complete this job like what is the perfect um candidate for this position based on the ways they like to work and the based of their previous experience and success. But then if you add a third element, then that further narrows the uh, the scope of your hire. And of course, if you are a powerful company like Google or Amazon or Netflix who don't have any kind of salary caps and have that amazing name, they can do those. They can add these additional parameters and you also have to be like a <laughs> you know a top athlete from your previous or some kind of a like mm -hmm. extracurricular activity that you have shown and and they can keep adding these elements and find their unicorns because quite frankly they have the name and the and the money to pay for the unicorns but it becomes more challenging for other organizations who don't have those resources and in those cases they have to concede uh, other elements so they might need to invest more into perhaps growing the, uh, the, the, the type of a candidate, if this uh, certain type of a diversity element is so important for them, then it's just a bigger investment on their side. If they can't do the money, then they have to invest into training and, uh, and, and leveling up that person as they join in. And time to hire as well. That's, that's a resource which people don't necessarily always think about, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, look, we, you, you can find this, but as you said, like, the, you know, the, the, big, the big companies mentioned there, they've also got time on their side, right? They, they can spend... Yeah you know, 12 months, 18 months filling a role because, you know, like they've, they've got that resource. So if you need to get somebody in in three, six months, then you, you're always thinking about, okay, which premise do I have? And either there is the perfect candidate, fantastic, and we will find you great candidates. But, you know, like maybe the, there's, sometimes there's only five people who've done what you need to do, right? And yeah. three of them said no, and you said no to two of them, right? That's that's it, right? So we've got we to gotta think about, we either wait six months and see if some of those people change their mind, or we go to another geography or, you know, you loosen up on X, Y, Z, right, criteria that you just sort of loosen up. Or, again, you're, you're just waiting or spending longer, um, you know, looking for, for, for that, that right candidate. Perfect. Um, all right. So that's clear. Uh, I got one more question before we jump in into the, uh, the community questions. So we got yeah. a few of those as well. Um, boom, boom, boom. Let me choose one of the ones that I have written through. Um, oh, this one is uh, easy. What are the common mistakes executives make during the hiring process? So we've talked a lot about from the uh, from the company side, uh, what elements they have been doing and, and how they approach this hiring. But if you're an executive and you are interacting with Mission One and you're going, or somebody else, some other, <laughs> I don't think company, like what are the mistakes that you see the uh, the executives make when you put them in, in, in touch, when they get yeah. from, from your pipeline to the uh, the pipeline of the, uh, or the processes of the, uh, of the uh, hiring company? Yeah, I think I think it's a great question. I think some of it would be around I think you know how, how are they approaching the, the the process as it were, right? Like there's a, there's a there's a sort of an assumption that like hey, if I'm the right candidate, right, I'll get the job, right? And and actually that's not that's not necessarily true, right? I think there's a little bit more involvement around you know, have have you really sort of you know been through the brief, right? Like have you thought about it? Have you use it in terms of just our interaction have you um 
have you used the headhunter, right, to get more detail? We're talking, you know, all these questions you're asking about, right? Okay, well, what's their definition of leadership? What's their real priorities in this search? What's, what is their culture like? What's going to be a turnoff for them, right? Like, I think that that preparation and investment of time into searches, if it's not there, that can be hampering to a candidate, right? And then they go into an interview, it's not the right fit, and they're, they're left feeling a little bit confused uh, about that. Um, also, sort of responding to feedback. I mean, it sounds really obvious, but sometimes, again, we've, we've had candidates who said, like, look, you know, you're a bit loquacious, right? So we say you're talking, it's a polite way of saying you talk way too much and just need to, like, tell it. And then, you know, and then the feedback from the client is, like, they talk too much. You're like, okay, well, I did. I did sort of say that to them ahead of, you know, ahead of time or whatever it was. Um, you know, there's there's a chance here to, um, you know, to just, just, just be responsive to that. And as I said, I think be a little less sort of perhaps... It's not arrogant. So it's, it's a little bit more assumptive that the process will find the right fit, um, mm. but more sort of treat it as something that you're putting work into and energy into. Um, and also, I think, you know, something I, I sort of encourage candidates to is, is also just sort of, you, you know, think about like, think about it from both sides, you know, like, am I the right fit, right? Like, is, is this the right fit for me? Like, let's yeah. test this out. You know, approach, I would sort of say, like, if you can approach it in that sort of spirit of like, you know, it's not it's not imperative that I get this job or, or, or from their side that, that, that I'm their hire, right? Like we want to work this out together um, because it might be you have a great interaction and great relationship and they go like, this isn't the right role for you, but hey, there's actually something else, right? There's another role in our other office, which you'd be perfect for that, that we've got or in six months time, it's, it's coming down the line. So and I, I think that can be also just a sort of, you know, it goes back to these themes of long-term relationship, um, thinking deeply, preparing, uh, and then also just being really honest as well. And I think, again, that authenticity piece comes comes through. So I was saying, well, I, I don't do these things. Is that a problem? But I do have these strengths, right? That's a lot better sort of saying that and having a conversation with the client about that versus them sort of discovering it, as it were, or, or thinking about it later. Um, and, and that can actually go down really well or, or, or come to a more interesting solution whereby you go, you know what, actually, um, you know, we are going to talk to them about a different role. And, and that's that's been a great outcome. Um, versus versus um, you know just just a very binary yes no to this this role. Yeah, the the one hundred percent. That's very typical. I've I've seen that in my own recruitment process over over the uh, over the years. And uh, funny enough, like when I was, for example, interviewing executives, interviewing my own bosses, like even the people who did not eventually get selected. We stayed in touch ever since, so, so uh, it's uh, it's 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 pretty awesome. Um, all right, so I have not asked enough questions. Now on to the community questions. So Gerard, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> well, let's go. Uh, I've noticed a few high level hires from outside the industry recently. For example, CEOs of Team Seventeen, but they are quite rare. Are we likely to see more as the industry matures? Would the industry benefit more? from hires outside the industry or are we so idiosyncratic that outsiders struggle to lead game companies? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. So thank you to whoever wrote that in. Um, so so about, I'd say about four years ago, about that, four or five years ago, um, I noticed something really interesting was that executives from outside of games were suddenly interested in games companies. It was this sort of zeitgeist change from like, I work for a games company, I'd be a bit embarrassed, you know, if you're like, I know you work at a fintech or something like that in your dinner party, the dinner party question, right? Like, that's kind of cool. You're working at unicorn fintech, whatever. Um, uh, I, I work for a computer games company, right? Like, again, like, historically, there's been a bit of stigma about that or there's a little bit like, it's a bit of a mystical world for a lot of people of, of um, you know, that's something that's non-mainstream. That has really changed. So, first of all, the interest from non non-gaming execs and coming into games has, has gone really high up people have seen the successes coming through they've seen the money coming through you look at candy crush or whatever you want to pick right like you know these games are bulls game you know these games are getting cut through culturally at a much higher level um and you know again compared to like media was much more respectful now like games has, has, has got that sort of like oh it's you know much more hype about games than, than, than a lot of media areas so um that's what that's one element I think that's good for games, and I think that that brings in talent from outside um, that can, you know, because there's a broad set of experiences and talent, right, really from really mature industries that can be brought into games. I think the, the, the nuance of this question is I think it varies by function by function. So CFOs 
fantastic, right? Like you, you can come from a different sector and come in with all this skill and learning and knowledge and come into games and that is enriching the game's experience. I think there's going to be you know, l lower risk in that function of tissue rejection and it being, you know, there's nuances. Obviously, you have to get your head around if you're on mobile or whatever. But, you know, there's, there's an element of like a commonality there that's, that's, that's really helpful. Product is harder, right? Again, like in design, it's harder because it is more specialized. It is more particular to the games industry. Um, at the CEA level, I'd say we're still we're still seeing. Um, I think that's a, that, that's a test case, right? I think um, it, it can be difficult because let, let's face it, like people who make games can be a, be a difficult bunch in their own way, right? They have a <laughs> they have like a, you you just want to make money, you know, like not like make good games. It's like well, okay, that's that's an interesting thing to be resistant to the idea that we're a company that wants to make money. Um, but you know, you you can get that. So so I think we will see more of it. I think we'll see more um, crossovers. Um, you know, I think so Bernard Kim, for example, so he's the CEO mm -hmm. of Match Group, which is, I, I don't know, it's like a $5 billion turnover, something like that, like it owns Tinder and all these other um, dating apps. So it's, it's, it's a large listed American uh, 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 organization. Um, Bernard Kim, he came from Zynga, for example, right? Like, and, and that's a really interesting example of, of going the other way, right? Like, so from, from games to one of the top consumer CEO jobs, right? And that's a games executive. And I think we, we didn't see that probably 20 years ago in the same sort of level. We wouldn't have seen those sorts of moves. So we're seeing more cross flows and some of these companies are becoming more hybrid in themselves, right? Like, you know, Duolingo, right? It's the classic one that everyone talks yes. about. Like it's a language learning app, very heavily gamified, right? So so is that a game, you know, in some, some degrees, is that a games company, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's got elements of that though. But so I think the, the, the broad answer to your question is, I think we will see more of it. I think there is still a high degree of, of tissue rejection. Um, you know, to, to wax a little bit lyrical is, is also we're seeing more companies from outside move into games, which is interesting. So you've seen that in both a good and bad way. You saw Google try and move in with Stadia. You've seen Amazon move in with um, Amazon Game Studios, you know, and they found that difficult, right? They've taken sometimes execs from mm. the non-games world and put them in charge of, of, of building a games company. And it, it, it's, I think, you know, I think the person running game, uh, as, um, Amazon, for example, they moved on after a period, right? It was, it was a difficult um, you know, uh, it's a world to, to cross. So um, I think we will see it, but it's still going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be some successes. Some, some, some people will find it difficult to, to mm. integrate, particularly at the CEO level. So diversity higher, essentially, diversity of mind coming yeah. in from yeah. either or the other way. So that question was, by the way, from Maria, CEO of Us2, just mentioning it was a great question. Oh, I know Maria. The, well. yeah. yeah, these questions are from the Director of Fund Slack Group. Um, uh, next one. Uh, <laughs> this is funny. Underneath my norm core exterior, I'm actually a bigwig in hiding, but no one noticed yet. How do I get to call, how do I get you to call me? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, so this is a co-founder of a company. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let up. Well, I mean, in, who, in a good way. In a good way. If you don't want to be contacted, you, you, you know that's okay too, right? Like if you don't want to make noise uh, and you're very happy, I, I think we should all respect that, right? And sometimes people put on their LinkedIn's like, please don't contact me, and that's that's great, right? Like, okay, I won't. Um, so I think I think you know I mean, the, the sort of the, the one is letting your network know, hey, I'm looking. Um, the other is honestly, you can reach out to us again. It's not, you know, it's not uh, in today's world. It's not difficult to find people, right? If you're like, hey, I want to find some yeah. headhunters in games, right? It's, it's a Google search or a LinkedIn search way to find some people, reach out, build a relationship. Again, but I'd say the, the best way is to find, you know, you you will have a network if you're a big wig. Go ask them. Go ask three, four people who are your who are your recommendations, and then get them to make the intro as well. Because again, I I to my shame, I, I get lots of intros. I don't have time to get back to them all, certainly in a timely manner. <laughs> um, you know, and and you know, again. But if Mishka, if you send me someone, say, hey, here's my friend, like talk mm. to them. I, I'm gonna get back. Oh to them, right? no, you, now now you said it. Now like I'll get no, hundred no, people asking. Bad example, Mishka. I, I just, it goes automatically you don't you don't reply to my messages. <laughs> Exactly. But um, yeah, exactly. And that, that's true as well. So, so um, you know, I'd go ask people again, there's lots of Slack groups out there nowadays mm -hmm. as well. There's lots of you know, industry, you know, events. So just, just ask people like, hey, I need, I need to get hold of you. And there's not too many of us in the world of games. There's probably like you know, four or five people globally who are very specialized. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, we're a small bunch. Um, to get to know. So I look forward to your bigwig friend, uh, Mr. And, <laughs> and, and probably makes, um, make some noise on, on, on LinkedIn. Like that's a good place because 
I assume a lot of headhunters spend a good amount of time on LinkedIn. That's their number one platform. And if you are visible there, if people are liking what you're sharing and you already have that type of a position, then most likely uh, a headhunter would connect because they are very interested in the, the movement of the industry and the trends. So if you're sharing that, good chance, chances are you'll get connected. Yeah, absolutely. Your, sort of your shop front is your LinkedIn profile as well. So just like yes. highlighting what it is you do as well. And it's, it's a broader, I think, you know, piece of information. It's like, just have clarity. And we didn't talk about too much about like, you know, um, well, it goes back to your little question about like what executives not do as well in an interview, but like really tailoring their experiences to, to what the, the hiring team is looking for is a big thing, right? Like, and, and similarly, tailor your LinkedIn for the job you want to get, right? Don't, you know, it's fine if you're open, but like if you're really keen to do a certain thing, make it really obvious you've done that sort of thing before and that this mm -hmm. is what you're passionate about. And that, that helps everyone out versus, you know, cuts through the noise of what you're going to get approached about. All right. Uh, next one. What are some clear red flags for exec hires? Short and... The candidate question. behavior we mean like what what do, what do people do i don't know this is this is what was written there's not a lot of yeah. context what um, are the red flags when for exec hires yeah i think I mean, we, we haven't talked about it but, but, but referencing is really important really really important when you get down to the nub and it it pains me that sometimes people seem to have hired when they haven't done the referencing right so mm. so we do referencing we don't do it all up front we sort of do a little bit of soft referencing at the start. And then we, as we get further down the road, we say like, okay, well, let's do formal referencing and also maybe talk to some other people in the market. So that's, that's super important because, you know, the reality is you might not catch all the red flags, right? Like, again, like some people can be excellent at presenting themselves and what they've done. And then you talk to their old boss and they're like, you know, like, oh <laughs> yeah, like I wouldn't trust them to like look after my dog type thing. You know, it's, it's, so referencing is really important and it demystifies like a magic skill you've got a spot for. I think, you know, the other thing is, Again, how do they treat you as a headhunter is really interesting. And again, like I think, you know, this this element of um are they are they taking you seriously? Are they are they turning up? Because again, like you've the, the very best, like the, the best top CEOs I've talked to, they're lovely. They make you feel <laughs> special. They, you know, like and this is the irony of like the the more senior people are actually the more you feel like they're giving their time the more they feel like they want to have a long-term relationship it's it's a real like irony people think that they're the most distant people because they're like you know stratosphere but, but it's often not the case right it's, it's it's the opposite and again you sort of get a sense sometimes of a little bit of like arrogance or like again sometimes a little bit of con like if they're concealing what's been done and again you know it's, again sometimes we're, we're savvy people so sometimes we know like that's not a great story. That company didn't do too well. It might have raised a billion dollars or it might have done, but I know like behind the scenes, like that, that wasn't a magic place. So if you're just talking about it, all the great stuff you did there and like, mm -hmm. it sounds rosy, that's a flag for me. That's a like, I, I'm okay with like, I went there and it was, it was not good, right? Like, and I, this is what we're trying to do. And it was a bit of a challenge. And this is really what happened. That can be a great answer. You know, when it's a like, oh yeah, we did all this stuff. It's great. Like, and then I moved off two years and, it, yeah. and it's like, it, it can be, just ringing a little bell in the back of my mind so i very rarely see very poor behavior or anything like very very rarely but i think a little bit of just if you get the sense somebody's not being honest with you or that they're like they feel like they're a bit too big for the role and that like that arrogance is coming across a little bit that those can be some real turnoffs again it goes back to the culture point a little bit of like mm. this, this person might not be right yeah so be just honest about everything if you've made mistakes talk about openly about the the mistakes you've made and that at least shows that you've probably learned from the mistakes you've made. And I think that's that I would assume that that is a positive uh, communication rather than, than just sugarcoating everything. It can be. Again, if it's all mistakes and you've got to watch out for that again. So don't, don't go yeah. overboard yeah. on the like <laughs> mea culpa of my, my career has been a series of failures. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, it's like like being, being honest about like, you know, I just think being real with someone can, can be a good you know, positive. You know, again, turning that yeah. negative into a positive. Perfect. Last one. My perception is that big companies prefer established executives from other big companies over experienced executives from smaller companies, like when Unity brought Riccatello after he left EA. What makes a big company to search for a small company's executives from time to time? What kind of attributes and feats they look for? Yeah, another another really, uh, really good question and, and well nuanced. Uh, it's a good good perception because. You know, some some of the reasons why they're doing this is because at very large corporations it's it's a different game they're playing right like when you are 
if you're in an EA or Unity, right, like the, the, the size and the scale of the organization is tremendous. And there's also a pressure from the markets, right? Like, or, you know, from, from that sort of, um, that, that sort of quarterly pressure to, to, to a cadence you could fit into. And therefore a like for like executive is, is really helpful um, because actually the job is often less about like making these games. It's more, I call it small P political, but you've got to be canny of what's going on in that room how these, you know, who's building an empire over there? Like how this all fits together? How can I be effective in a in an EA or an AB or whatever it is? Is very different from how I can be effective in a smaller organization, which is perhaps, perhaps more interesting, just like making the game, right, or, or whatever it is. Right, there's there's different parts at play. Um, you know, I think how can you make yourself more attractive if you're in a, in a smaller company? Um, I think it's being aware of that, right? Being aware, and again, this is true of any any if you're trying to make any any sort of switch show show you're not naive about the difference right whatever it is being like you know show like hey this is different like again don't overemphasize it don't, don't over labor it but like be aware of saying obviously you guys work differently on this and and then having a good example or a good reason why actually you do fit into that right and and, and be aware of that nuance so if it is a very large publisher or something like that and you, you're thinking okay like You've done your research. You've understood. Yeah. Okay, this is the type of exec they like, and this is why they like that, and that's why that's important to them. Be able to tailor your experiences more to to, mm. to de-risking that to make it sound more like this is actually quite akin to how you've been you've been been working, and that you're running towards that. Um, I think can be you know, is, is 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 smart is the smart, but also be you know be really again pretty honest with yourself. Like, do you want to go do that? Because it is a different yeah. experience. The, so so this is the, the interesting part about this question because it creates the sort of a perception that a big company is always better than a small one mm. to work. When in fact, I wouldn't say in fact, there are different people that like working at a big company. But the same thing you would say if, if a big company executive would come in to work at a smaller company. Like they are not used to the, uh, the limited resources that they would have. They are not used to the fact that they would actually have to be a more of a T-shaped professional where they have to have their, get their hands dirty. They don't have 30 people they can command uh, to do different type of things or hundreds of people in, in, in some cases. So, uh, so I, I feel like uh, this, this question is positioned a little bit in a way that, that bigger is always better, but bigger is just different. And yeah. And, I, yeah. Absolutely. And again, we're, we're not sort of defining what we mean by small. I was thinking of sort of mid, mid-sized companies that are going to, yeah, to a large. Yeah, mid-sized. Yeah, exactly. Mid to Again, large. it could be from a startup to, you know, so it's, yeah. And I, I think that's, you know, and again, like, you know, larger companies, like you might have to lay off, you know, like your job might be like, hey, you're running a thousand people and your job is to lay off 150 people or 200 yeah. people this year or something like that. And, and again, it's a different, different types of people are okay with that. Right. And, and people have experience or, or, or structure that differently. So, so again, I think it's just having a real sort of deep think about why do you want to make that move? And then if you've got a load of good reasons why you want to make that move and, and think that's right, then you're probably constructing that argument to, to make to the company, yeah. or to the hiring team to say, look, this is this is actually a really natural step for me um, to, to, to go make. And I, I think this is this is right. Exactly. Horses for courses, as, as mm. people say. <laughs> so uh, uh, on that note, Jared, thank you so much for, for coming on this podcast. I think we'll do a few more. This is interesting. We'll probably get uh, more tangible, but really uh, curious to hear people's feedback on this. Uh, so please, either on Deconstructor Fund Slack channel or on LinkedIn, reach out to Jard. Um, put a comment on this podcast section, whether on YouTube or Spotify or wherever, and um, we'll, we'll use that information to craft more episodes uh, about this topic because hiring is very important, especially in today's market. So, Gerard, thank you so much for all the candid information and um, looking forward to the uh, next session. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much, Mishka. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening.